Oh, wow. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for dropping in. Oh, there's a good word here. Uh, I'd like to ask you to join me and let's fellowship together on this edition of the Prophetic Chronicles. Talk to you in a minute. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to the Word of God through Jesus Christ, Street and Irish Telecast. My name is Apostle Alan E. Coleman Jr., and the Lord has assigned me and appointed me as the Apostle, the Prophet, and the Teacher under him over this ministry. And so uh, we're going to get right into this because we have a lot to cover tonight. This is going to be very, very powerful, okay? I'd like to ask you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter... Well... Just turn to Genesis. Get it prepared. Have your pens, your papers, and the ministry's phone number is 475-300-3850 for a 24-hour prayer or questions or whatever, a praise report, anything. Also, the Cash App link, if you're watching by Facebook Live, is in the description. And for those that are watching by television and DVD and uh, VHS, uh, it's going to be on the screen somewhere. You'll see it somewhere on the screen. But I, I want to say let's go into prayer so we can jump right into this, all right? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, first of all, before we even approach you, we ask you to forgive us for all of our sins and our shortcomings. Forgive us for our faults and our wrongs. We ask, Lord, that you forgive us for everything that we have done, said, thought, and felt from the time we were born up to this very moment. Please forgive us, Father. Please, Lord, we have disappointed you at times. Even before we were accepted into your family, we have disappointed you. When you were trying to call us, we have disappointed you. Even still, you try to say stuff to us and do things in our life, and at times we disappoint you. Please, please forgive us. Help us, strengthen us, teach us, empower us, minister to us, purge us by the power of the Holy Ghost. Oh, God. By the blood of the Lamb, please wash us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. And I ask, Lord, that you make me usable and use me. Fill me with the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Give me a spiritual understanding of your word. And use me, O oh God, to teach, to explain, to share. In the name of Jesus. Satan. By the power of the Holy Ghost, man, we bind you. We plead the blood of Jesus against you. We loose all of our stuff from your grip. And we plead the blood over our stuff as a covering. We command you to go back to the pit of hell from where you came. Because that's your jurisdiction according to Matthew 25, 41. Every demon that works for you, we cast them out. Don't matter what their name is. It don't matter what their rank is. We cast them out of our life and our affairs and out of our business and everything. In the mighty name of Jesus, we loose our blessings from their grip also, and we plead the blood over our stuff as a covering. We command those demons to go back to the pit of hell from where they came as well. And Father, in Jesus' name, please, please don't let them come back no more. Raise up the standard against them, which is your word, glory. And please dispense holy angels to come into the earth realm, to stand in the place where we just cast those demons out, that they can't come back no more. Allow me to be calm in you. Please, Father. Minister to us. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hmm. See, I, I really got stirred up. Y'all preachers know and teachers, you know, you get stirred up and next thing you know, psh, you're gone. You, you know, you'll see my body standing here, but I'll be somewhere else. In the spirit. All right. Now, oh, yes, Lord. I have to be on the chopping block. My heart is heavy tonight. I was sitting before the Lord in prayer about some things 
that he's trying to do in my life, about some things he's trying to do in other people's life, about some things he's trying to do in, in even other people's life. And the truth of the matter is, we are all under attack because the Holy Ghost is placing us in a position of blessing. Now, you got to remember with all of this stuff going on and this demon named coronavirus running to and fro, attacking the earth, attacking the nations, attacking the people. Those of us that are part of that remnant that God is bringing forward, he's positioning us. No, listen, we don't lie. We don't cheat. We don't steal. We don't do people wrong. We're honest. We are a fellowship in the name of the Lord and no other name. And, and, and we have a relationship with him. We talk to him. We pray to him constantly. We're in fellowship. So those of us that walk that way, that walk with the Lord, he's positioning us for blessing. He's getting ready to bless us in ways that we couldn't even imagine. There's some of us that the Lord is positioning for the biggest blessing that we could, could ever even imagine. We can't even fathom what it is that he's trying to do. In some cases, the only problem is us. Is us. Because we are trying in some cases. Now stay with me. I got to go as the Holy Ghost leading me. We are trying in some cases to handle spiritual blessings in natural ways. And we're going to mess up if we don't stop. Be still. Go before the face of God and stay there. Stay there. We, we got to stay there. We can't do it any other way. We got to stay there. And the Holy Ghost has said unto me earlier, like I said, I was minding my business. I thought I was going to end up playing my Wii game and shooting some deer and some, some bears and all of that stuff. And the Lord said, no, I want to use you tonight again. I can't tell them no. And that's one of the, the luxuries that we don't have when we walk with him. We don't have the luxury to say no. We don't have that. If anybody think that they can get away with telling God no about something, you in trouble. You are jeopardizing the next level. You're jeopardizing the next season. You are jeopardizing what it is that God want to do for you. Because he died for us. He gave himself to himself for us. Y'all y'all could catch that. I hope you can catch it. If you can't catch it, then that's on you. But if you can catch it, catch it and hang on to it. He came into the earth realm at the same time he was sitting on the throne in heaven. You can look at John 3 and 13. That'll tell you that. And he gave himself to himself as an offering for us a perfect offering so that we can be redeemed when the word says that we are peculiar people it don't mean strange it means we are a purchased possession it's important to understand that because if you don't understand that then you don't understand the purpose of your existence. Watch this. You also won't understand the purpose of your trials because your trials fit your calling. <laughs> Glory. Your trials fit the office that you are in. Your trials. Watch this. God's just told me. He just told me to say this. Even if you're in the wrong office, once you go through the trial that's fit for that office and you're in the wrong office, you 
are going to fall. You're going to fall. Because, you know, remember Jesus said to those that read, remember Jesus, uh, there was a woman, James and John mother, this, you know, the sons of Zebedee, their mother said, would you, when you get your kingdom, would you let one of my sons sit at your right hand and one sit at your left? He said, can they drink the cup that I'm going to drink from? Your trial is fit for your walk. There's some things that we all have been through that the Holy Ghost reached into our mess and took us out of. So that he can shape us up, educate us, teach us, and send us back out to do a work for him. Tonight, the Lord is leading us to start another series. And the title, <laughs> the thought of this series, well, I, all right, the Lord said, do it afterwards. First, let's, let's read some scripture so we can set set the stage according to the word so that way as the lord use us to go forward we already have our platter set now we're going to go backwards because we're going to be in genesis and we're going to cover three sections of scripture in genesis but uh we're going to go backwards kind of so uh the other night we were talking well all right, the Lord said, just go. Genesis 24, please. Now, I'm going to be reading out of the King James Version, but I better grab the Living Bible in case I need it. Uh, the Lord tell me to switch up. That's what I'm going to do. And as you know, this ministry has a plethora of Bibles. Scripture says, Chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. That means everything was in place. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. That means he ceased working. He stopped. He was finished. He completed everything. There was nothing else to do. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, meaning he set it apart. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Or in the Hebrew, it says created to make. He sanctified that day as a memorial, saying he finished on the sixth day and on the seventh everything was complete which is why the number seven is a number of completion verse four said these are the generations of the heavens and on the earth when they were created in the day that the lord god made the earth and the heavens it tells you how he did all of that and then in verse 8 of chapter 2, it tells you about the Garden of Eden and the Edenic Covenant. And down in verse, down in verse, it should be 15. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Dress it there means to decorate it. Keep it means to guard it, to protect it. Verse 16 says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, now God gave him the condition of being in this garden of every tree of the garden 
In the Hebrew it says, eating thou shalt eat. In the English it says, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That word die, death right there. Theologically, we understand death to mean separation. There's physical death where your soul is separated from your body. And then there's spiritual death where your soul is separated from God. So God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt be separated. Separated from God. Why? Because he told you don't do this. And if you do it, when you do it, you're going to be separated from him. Why? Because he won't tolerate sin. Not at all. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him, which means a suitable helper. He goes into father mode instantly because remember, Adam and Eve were made grown. They weren't made children. They never were physical children, natural children, according to age and size. Everything God made in the garden was the prototype. It was the model. It was the adult version. That old joke, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in the garden of Eden, the chicken came first. And God even said in scripture that, let's see, verse 11 of chapter 1, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself. So the seed was in the adult version. Again, verse 18. I will make him, chapter 2, Genesis. I will make him and help me for him. A suitable helper for him. Why? Because it is not good that the man should be alone. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. This is not the chronological order because if you remember, the animals were made right before Adam. So this is recapping that the Lord did form every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. But since he made them, these are what he brought unto Adam to see what he would call them. Now here's what God gave Adam headship and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. God gave him that privilege, that honor, that authority. And Eve, was not made yet. So there's a certain anointing that God gave to man that he had not given to his counterpart because she was not created yet. Adam was the head. After Adam named all the cattle and the fowl of the air and every beast, and God said, but for Adam there was not found in help meet for him. There's nobody on his level. None of this that I've created, these animals are on his level. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. It's the first sleep. Remember, Genesis is the book of firsts. This was the first nap, the first sleep 
Actually, this was a deep sleep. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And when God brought her unto Adam, it was Adam who looked at her and named her. God didn't tell him to name her. You don't see where he said that. But it says that he brought her unto the man. And when he brought her unto the man, Adam already knew what to do. Why? How? Why? How? Why? Because he was anointed as the head. When God has placed you over something, he already gives you the know-how. You just have to be a good steward and utilize it. This was Adam's first ministry before naming his wife, before going, the Lord causing him to go into a deep sleep. Before that, when God said, when he put him in the garden and told him, of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat from it for in the day that thou dost eat from it thou shalt surely die when you eat from this tree you're gonna die you're gonna be separated but before then it says god put the man in the garden to dress it and to keep it that was his first ministry his first ministry was carrying out what god told him to do now to help me was supposed to be included in the work to help him to accomplish what God had assigned him to do. That's the first husband and wife ministry team, Adam and Eve. When God brought her unto Adam, Verse 23, Adam said, this is now, from this moment on, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, which is from the Hebrew word eshaw, because she was taken out of man which is from the Hebrew word ish. Therefore, therefore, shall a ish leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his ishah and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. He didn't lust after her. That wasn't, he didn't comment on her body right then. It don't say, not even revelatorily, that he named her body parts. It didn't say that. He went deeper, deeper than the flesh, much deeper. He looked at her and said, now, this is now bone of my bones. That's inside the flesh. He went deeper than the outside. Because she was taken out of man. Again, he looked inside and saw who she was. When God places a woman in a man's path, my brothers, pay attention to this, please. When you are in the season of waiting for your wife and God brings the woman to you, just like he did there, 
Eve. It doesn't say that Eve knew anything. She was just a willing vessel submitted unto God because she was a, a submissive vessel. And when God brought her, it don't say she went kicking and screaming and putting up resistance or she stopped and paused. And it didn't say none of that. She willingly came. And Adam willingly received her. When he said, A man for this, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, Adam had no mother, but he had a father. So this word that was spoken was a from now on covenant agreement will now it doesn't tell us per se if adam said it or if god said it but one thing we know is yahweh elohim officiated this wedding <laughs> oh glory if we were there, or if if there was any other officiator, and they said, who is it that gives this woman to this man? God would say, it is I, her father, her maker, her creator, her designer. But he was Adam's father, too. So God officiated the wedding. He let them lay down the ground rules. He put them together. That right there, he did the hardest part. According, if we were to compare to our ability, he did the hardest part. Not only did he make everything and dress the whole earth, but he formed a man and put him in it. And then he caused the man to go to sleep and he created this woman and brought her to the man. Nobody could have done that but God. So brothers, when you're in a season of waiting for your wife, God will send her. And when she comes, he will bless you to look at her and say, is she the one? If you walk with God and you're walking with him and you're praying your way through this season, when God bring her, you'll know that that is her. You'll know because God will allow you to see inside just like Adam saw inside. He would let you see inside. That's her. Because God would give you the checklist. The checklist was, for Adam was there was no other help meet for him, so God was making him a suitable helper, someone on his level, someone to walk right with him. That she might help him to complete what God called him to do. That was the model. But then there was trouble. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle. That means crafty, sneaky, slick than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. In the Hebrew it says, Because God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. But let's stick with the English rendition. 
because it's 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 connected. Hath God said? And we could throw also in the Hebrew rendition, because God said. Why? Because the enemy always starts off his challenge with a question. How do you know that's the one? How do you know he's the one? How do you know she's the one? Look at her. Isn't she too short? Or isn't she too tall? Look at him. Isn't he too big? Isn't he too small? Isn't he too broke? Isn't he too this? Look at her. Isn't she too needy? Isn't she? He always come with a question to challenge the blessing. That's why it's important that you know that it's God that put it together. Because if God put it together, though on the outside it might look one way, on the inside it's put together right. Right. But we have the biggest struggle when it comes to receiving from God. Because it's easy for us to hear the enemy's voice because he talks loud right in your mind. He will give you a headache right in your mind because he's going against what God is saying here because God is talking so soft. First Kings, chapter 18, I believe. Actually, chapter 19. And down in... <laughs> verse... Verse 8, about Elijah the prophet. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Jealous there also means zealous. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, this is what God said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, which we broke it, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and said what doest thou here Elijah when the Lord tells you brother that that's your wife he may not do a great big ta -da 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 -da, but he'll tell you that's your wife I'm going to tell you from experience what I'm going through right now the biggest struggle is going to be her hearing God also. If she's not delivered from her, then it's going to be hard for her to hear God. 
And so then we had to hurt. That puts us at a struggle with our walk. Because see, when God, listen, Adam had a garden. When Eve was brought by God into Adam, he had authority, he had a garden, he had a ministry, he had an assignment, and now he had a responsibility, which was his wife. So by her just walking into this, being brought by God, sister had it going on and she had it made. And it's still like that now. My sisters, listen to this. When God sends the man of God to your life, God is not going to send him with no okie doke. God is not going to send him with no game. Oh, there's going to be something you might look at him and go, ah, oh, I don't know about that. On the outside, that's not what I want. He might be chubby. He might be this. He might be that. You might be missing a tooth. You never know. But you got to be able to look deeper than that. And, and, and to look deep. <laughs> yes, Lord. God said to look deeper than that. First, you got to look at you. Look back. Where you came from. What did God bring you from? More than likely, back there, there was Mr. Slick, Mr. Smooth. Mr. Cool, Mr. All of that, and none of them had the woman of God. They had the natural woman. They didn't look and say, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. They looked and said, I want that. When the Lord joined people together, the result is marriage. So when the man comes, look, Eve could have easily said, Adam, you being pushy, brother. You being pushy. You naming me? You, you getting rid of my identity? You, but see, that wasn't the deal. Adam had authority. God brought her to him to be his help me. She was to assist him. So Adam, who was with God before she was, he heard from God what the mission was and what the ministry was. So this help me had to be capable to carry out what this brother needed to accomplish what God told him to do. So when a man of God looks at you, my sister, and he says, God said, you're the one. That means that God told that brother, you are able to accomplish what God has told this man to do. You're able to help this brother, to walk with him. He, he don't need you for anything material. No, no. no. He, the building part is awesome when two people do it. And the man of God is not going to lust after you. It don't mean he's not going to look at you and say how beautiful and a compliment your beauty. But that's not going oh, that's not going to be his first step. That's not going to be his first agenda. That's not going to be the first thing he wants. The man of God first looks at where you are spiritually. Where are you? Are you walking with, yes, Lord, did you hear God? Are you walking with God? God just said these words. Adam saw her, and who was bringing her to Adam? God. She was walking with God. When the Lord came to Adam, Eve was with him. God brought her to Adam. Hey, man, I congratulate you guys that already have your wife. You guys that have been married 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Hey, man, I tip my hat to you. 
I'm talking to the same brothers because, man, listen, if she went through trials, ups, downs, lefts, rights, rocks, paper, scissors, the whole shebang, man, listen, you are a blessed brother. And don't try to hinder somebody else that God is blessing. Because there's brothers who got theirs and want others too, or want to hinder others too, because they're not really satisfied with what they have. So they're looking at someone else. And when and I'm talking to leaders now, and when those leaders see that she's interested in somebody, them leaders try to throw salt. But you can't do that. See, because God will deal with you. He'll deal with you. Not only will you not get the one you're trying to interrupt or interfere with, but you'll lose the one you've got. So don't play. If you're not holy, stay away. Back up. But if you are holy and live in that way, then let God use you as a vessel to speak for the Lord. God said, Adam didn't have a help me, and God fixed the situation. Not only did God give him a help me, but we'll see in a minute that God also gave her a protector, someone to protect her, someone that was going to stand between her and problems. The man of God to do that. He'll stand in front of his wife so nothing can happen to her because he loves her and he appreciates God giving her to him. The serpent said to her, has God really said? Or in the Hebrew, because God really said. See, when that because God really said come out, now he's trying to get her to go against what God said. Either way, by any means necessary, he's going to try to cause her to be disobedient. Watch this. The reason he didn't go to Adam is because Adam got his instructions straight from God. So Adam would have told him, no, God said. See, he would have told him the word of God. But what he did is he went to the help. And he said, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now he want to know what she know. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die now if you look back in chapter one and wait a minute is it chapter one or chapter two let's see put the man press, uh, okay uh whom you have out of the ground okay chapter two Verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Both of them was right there in the middle. Two trees in the middle of the garden. Two trees. And the enemy tried to point her to the bad one. She said, verse 2 of chapter 3, And the woman said unto the servant, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now he told her half true right there what was the half true oh you're not going to die physically and the enemy he's carnal and his whole his whole 
projection is carnal. His whole conversation is carnal. His whole agenda is carnal. There's nothing holy about the enemy of God. So, of course, he wasn't talking about holiness. He was talking about physical death right there. You shall not die. He tried to throw her off. And then scripture says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's clearly telling her what tree he's talking about. He's not talking about the tree of life. He's talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he's telling her, you're not going to die. You will not physically die when you eat this, which was a lie, because she died spiritually, and that resulted in physical death. But he tried his best shot. And verse 6 says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Now, if you look back again in verse in chapter 2, where it says in verse 9, that out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So here in chapter 3, Verse 6, it says that when the woman saw the tree, that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. So this was, God already created, everything God made was good and it was beautiful and the whole shebang. So she, are, she are, the devil played on those two traits. He played on that. We don't know what he said, but knowing how he do, he probably built a whole picture around that look at how beautiful that tree is boy god made that tree so beautiful and it's delicious he made it delicious but he added something to that watch this it says verse 6 of chapter 3 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant uh pleasant to the eyes which actually means a desire to the eyes so now her emotions are kicking in with her sight. She's seeing something, and I don't like you, well, and she's feeling something about this. She's desiring it. It's something that made her desire it. And then it says, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, not to, not the family, but to make one what self solo. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Then it says, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So now he just got finished being used by God to name his wife, to speak over the covenant. And now here he is standing there while the enemy is talking to his wife. While the enemy is betraying or causing her to betray God, the enemy is talking to his wife and filling her mind with words. Now being that the devil is the father of lies, he had to uh, get everything that has a father has a mother. Now, here we see that Eve, she lied. She, she straight up lied. When she saw, it, it, scripture says right here, she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. It was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. And, de, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof. But she said, back up in verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, this is what she said, <laughs> ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Lest means or, like there's a choice. But let's notice what God said to Adam in chapter 2, verse uh, 16. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now let's compare these, this report. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Eve said also, God has said, ye shall not eat of it. Okay. And then God said to Adam, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In the Hebrew it says, dying, thou shalt die. Eve said that God said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, or you'll die. It's not what God said. The enemy is tricking a lot of brothers and sisters. You got to be careful. You got to be careful. One of the worst things I find, I've heard before sisters say, because there's some that call the ministry for counseling and so forth, and I've heard sisters say, well, I said that I'm led by the Lord, and I follow what the Lord say. So I asked them, what did he say? Uh, I, I don't know. Okay. Now let's let's examine this for a minute. My mouth is dry. Let's examine this for a minute. If you're waiting for God to reveal something to you, okay, I'll give you a good example. I gotta put my head on the chopping block. Oh. Leaders always gotta do that. We always gotta put our head on the chopping block. Don't ever think that leaders get away scot-free with things because we don't. The Lord has put a woman in my path. I got to say this because right now I am in a battle over a blessing that the Holy Ghost allowed me to look down inside and see what he promised me in a wife. I, I, I'm looking and I, I, I see, I saw, he presented the outer, <laughs> he brought the outer vessel right to me. He brought the person to me. And then he said, notice my daughter, the prophetess. I will bless you to be married if I'm allowed to. Okay. And I looked and I saw and I said, oh my goodness, wow, Lord, look at that anointing. See, I didn't say body. Lord, look at that anointing. Oh my goodness, listen to those articulate words. Oh, Lord, you are awesome. And the Lord said unto me, she'd make a good wife, wouldn't she? And then he allowed me to see, and I, yes. See, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Because when you are wrapped up in him, then what his will is becomes your desire. And that's what you want. And he will give it to you. But it has to come. It has to be the same thing that God wills for your life. You can't want this if God is desiring to give you this. Because if you want this while God is talking about this, then you are, you are outside of the perimeter. So because I say, Lord, you are my God. You are my Lord. This is what we all need to say. You are my Lord. Everything I have, it belongs to you. However, you want it to be used. You just tell me and it's, it's done. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. He's told me since 2012, your wife is on her way. I've met a lot of sisters in ministry and out. Now, the, as far as the out part, I'm not attracted to no unsaved woman. That's not at all. I wouldn't care 
what she look like on the outside because I'm not one of them guys that base anything upon the outside. My thing is, where you at on the inside? Are you with God? That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Lord, where is she? So this, this sister, God showed me the inside of her. We all have a past of some sort. We all do. I do too. We all do. There's nobody that, that came to Christ squeaky clean. He had, especially those of us on the front line, those of us that are part of that remnant that he's raising up right now and putting out on the front line and moving those other ones, the international minister, and all them out the way because they done messed up and goofed up. Now he's bringing us to the forefront. Yes, there's a shifting going on. And so, uh, listen, we all have come from something. But the Lord spoke and speaks highly of this sister. He says, look at her. Oh, God. And what he gave me to share, I share with her. Meaning, telling her, hey, God said, you are on your way. And here you are. Now, listen to this. <laughs> While God was, before he made Eve, when he brought Eve to Adam, Adam already had in him commitment. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called Ishar, because she was taken out of Ish. She shall be called woman, woman, because she was taken out of men. This is commitment. A man of God does not approach a woman of God talking about, can we date? Or let's go together. Or let's shack. No, they're not going to do that. When they approach the woman of God, they're going to let her know, listen, I'm on a mission. <laughs> I'm running for Jesus. <laughs> and I'm doing things that God had me do. And he told me that a help me is coming because he's bringing her. And he said, it's you. Now, I'm focused. I'm focused. See, the man of God, he is, you know, you might say, oh, that's pushy, or that's too aggressive. Or, no, he's focused. Why? Because he just sat with God. And God told him, I'm getting ready to bless you. Keep walking, right? Keep working. Like right now, look, you know what time it is? It must be about two, maybe three in the morning. I don't know. I don't have on a watch. Ain't no need to wear no watch right now. My watch is in the room, but ain't no need to have no watch on because I'm focused on what God got me to do. I can't stop until God say, that's it. Once the Holy Ghost say, that's it, then the book is closed, the, the, the TV equipment, all the cameras and lights are taken down, and it's a wrap. And then goes the editing, and then it gets put out. But in the meantime, I have to still do what God tell me to do. See, when he's your Lord and when you're working for him, it, that, you know, he will keep you up so you don't get tired. That anointing will keep you up. So Adam loved Eve. He accepted her. He didn't know that she was going to in the next chapter, eat fruit and give some to him and wreck everything. He didn't know that. But all he saw was that she was walking with God. Because that's who brought her to him. And those of us men of God that see the wife that God said, 
And it's not about age, because in the spirit, there's no age. No age. And it is good that a woman of God have a man that's a husband that's more seasoned. Not only seasoned, advanced in the things of God. How else is he going to lead her or carry her if he's not? How can he feed her? If she got a question about the word, if he's not learned or established or a, a skillful swordsman with the word of God, how is he going to answer her? How is he going to tell her, you know, honey, scripture says this, and let's look over there. See, if she got to lead the Bible study, there's a problem with that picture. There's a problem with that picture. The wife that God put in front of me. I love her. Because he gave the love to me for her. He put it in my heart. There was already some there that I've been carrying for years because God said, give this to your wife. And he left it right in my heart. But then when he blessed me to see her, he added some more to that and said, give this to her too. Thank you, Jesus. My brothers, I'm sure you could understand. Some of you could. If God told you that's your wife, man, pray for her, fast for her, fight for her. Don't give up on her. Because if she don't know, it's not, it's, it's not that she don't know God. She just might not be used to a brother of your caliber. See? Because there's a lot of bums out there. Even wearing collars and robes. There's a lot of bums out there. There's a lot of guys out there that don't bit more know God. They went to a store, bought a robe, got on the internet, got some kind of certificate, a license or something, and they fake, they, they perpetrate, I was going to say faking the funk. They perpetrate it. They perpetrate in a fraud. Some of them claiming to be prophets. Then there's some claiming to be apostles. Then there's some that trying to be smooth, cool evangelists. Then you got the tricksters trying to be pastors. And all they want to do is build a kingdom. And then you got those that are unlearned, yet call themselves teachers. So she might have she met some of them. And then meet you and God using you to, to speak the real truth, minister to her spirit, minister to her emotion, because she know, wow, I could fall for him. I could, I could love him. She see that. I was told by a woman, one of my cousins, I don't know how true it is because I'm not a woman, but I was told a woman could look at a man and within five minutes she know if she would give herself to that man. She knows. And, and that's deep. That's very deep. That's very deep. But she might have met those bums that played the role and tricked her and deceived her. Messed her up. Stole from her. Drained her bank account or something. Or just, just, just left her stranded. Got what they want and kept it moving. No. Now, my sisters, listen to this. If that sounds like something you've been through, don't fault the man of God. Don't fault the man of God. Because you got to remember, the enemy sometimes come with the counterfeit before the real comes. So you, you got to be wise and stay in the word. Stay before, excuse me, stay before God. Spend time with God. Don't, don't fight. Don't fight against God. Don't fight against what God is doing because he's trying to bless you. He's trying to bless you. 
He, listen, when you was crying because of being abused, neglected, lied to, beat on, cheated on, and, 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 and all of that, God was listening to you. When he comforted you, it's because he was going to bless you. But first he wanted to put the band-aid on and the, peri the spiritual peroxide. And he wanted to clean you up. He wanted to wash you up. He wanted to introduce you more to him so that you would know that he is a provider. And then, then, he sent the man of God. Don't. Don't fight against God. <laughs> the man of God will hurt because of you. Especially when God give him a love for you. Again, my head is on a chopping block, man. I'm, I'm really not comfortable with this. Some people look at you and say, oh, you soft. No. Real. And focused. And focused. When Adam, when God brought Eve to Adam, remember, God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I make a help me for him. After Adam named all the animals, God says, still, there's no suitable helper for him. So God allowed Adam to know that something is missing from your life. Now, I was talking to some guy a couple of days ago, and the guy asked me, hey, man, if God sent a woman to you, a wife, and she had kids, would you accept her? I said, of course I would. Why? Because, there's, again, some women have met bums. And they trusted them and gave them their heart and their body and some of them to have some babies. And the poor kids, uh, you know, the mother got to raise the kids by herself, no help, no one to, to, especially sons, you know, no one to strengthen them or to teach them how to be men. And it's something. An uncle shouldn't have to do that. A grandfather shouldn't have to do that even though they usually pick up the slack. But God would bless his daughter with a man, a son of God's, that the Lord will put them together and God will build a Brady Bunch. Don't think he won't. He will build a Brady Bunch in a minute. He will. I couldn't believe this guy said he wouldn't. I wouldn't accept nobody else, kids. But he said he a Christian. And when I found out he was in Kenya, I said, oh, no wonder you over there. He said, what that got to do with it? And, and I, I just let it go. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> anybody can say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But if that's not how they're living, then, you know, then they don't mean it. Even the Lord said that there'd be many that say, Lord, Lord. The enemy tricked Eve and her broken down husband stood right there and watched her. And the serpent didn't slither up to her. Mm -mm. For though you, you read the scripture. The serpent walked up right. You look at a snake skeleton, you'll see little tiny leg bones. You'll see that. But anyway, the serpent walked up to her. Why? Because the devil, if he would have came in the garden as he is, what he really looked like, they would have known something was wrong and out of order. So what he did is use the body of the most cunning beast of the field that God made. The serpent. Satan used that body. Animals have no choice in being used by spirits, by demons. They don't got no choice. That's why they're vicious and attack and kill and bite and chew, because those are demons that are using the animals to do that. When God made everything, the animals were docile. That means very, very easygoing, very soft and gentle. But after sin hit the universe, 
and was in the earth realm, them animals, they got off the hook. They decided to go on ballistic. And yes, dinosaurs too. Mm -hmm. There was dinosaurs? Of course there was. Don't you see them in the museum? Nobody made them. They, they were, yeah, that, that's true. It wasn't cavemen before Adam. It wasn't that. The Bible says that it says right here in chapter 1, verse 24. No, verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fire that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, verse 24, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything, everything, everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. It was told. It was good. Nothing was wrong. Those animals wasn't ferocious and vicious. They were, they were laid back. So the serpent was used by the devil to ask Eve what she knew. She added to God's word and took from it. The way she added to it, she said, in verse 3 of chapter 3, But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. She added that. Lest ye die, meaning or you'll die. She took away from what God told Adam, thou shalt surely die. So the enemy <laughs> asked her, and, and, and she, what she should have did, since her husband was right there. See, they both were wrong. She should have said, honey, Adam should have, when he saw it, that serpent coming up and started talking to his wife. Adam should have stepped in. Honey, I got this. Yes? That's what he should have did. He should have protected her. God didn't just give her to be his help me. But Adam had dominion over everything in the garden. God said, dress and keep it. Keep the garden meant to guard it and protect it from the enemy and protect everything in the garden, meaning even his wife. But he didn't. And when she ate the food, <laughs> she gave some to him. And he ate too. And then both of them fell. Both of them fell. Now see, in one sense, he had to eat it because they were one. If she had to eat it and he didn't, then that means when God kicked him out the garden, he would have kicked one out and left the other. That, uh -uh. That was, that, that's not how he made things to be. Adam just spoke over his marriage, over his wife, over the covenant. This is now bone, the bone, bone of my bones. I, it didn't say the bone. It said bone of my bones. Every bit of you is connected to me. I accept you. I receive you. I receive you. But what he should have did is before she ate the fruit, while the serpent was talking and she was looking at it, hmm, had that far away look in her eye, he should have stepped in right then and said, baby, baby, no, God said, God said, and you, I rebuke you. 
He had the authority. He had the power to do so because God gave it to him. That's what he should have did. But he did. And as a result, when their eyes were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, or in the Hebrew it says, or things to gird about. So what they did is they tried to cover not only their, naked, their nakedness, but they also tried to, to rely on their own righteousness to cover themselves, to fix their issues, to fix their problem. My righteousness. A lot of people have their own righteousness. And you can't have that because your righteousness, <laughs> yes, yes, Lord. You, did you hear God? The Lord just said, tell them all of their righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Mine too. I received that. No matter what we do right, it's still not good enough. Anything we do right is not going to get us into heaven because you can't work your way there. We get to heaven by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's a whole different issue. But self-righteousness don't accomplish nothing. Don't matter how good you sing, preach, pray, evangelize, prophesy, uh, establish as an apostle, or teach, or shepherd, nothing. It, it, none of that. And it's getting so now in the ministry, people are adding practices and claiming to win souls that way when scripture i used to be a dj when i was in the world i was a dj when i was a bad dj i battled i never lost a battle i was i did radio i did clubs i also uh did uh parties and all of that and i also was an mc uh, I, I battled mcs i bust them up and good thing i'm saying because i wasn't saved i still got it it's, it's different when you're an MC because it's the style versus when it's in you. I am a lyricist, praise God. And, and you know, if, uh, MCs that know me, I got a history. They know, don't mess with Dr. E. They remember my name. But when the Lord brought me out of that, he said to me, don't go back to that. Don't go back to that. So somebody said to me a couple of years ago, hey, brother, he, he knew I used to be a DJ. He said, hey, brother, you could be a Christian DJ. Huh? He said, you could be a Christian DJ, man. I said, no, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, because when God told me to stop DJing in 1993, I DJed from 77 to 93. When God told me to come out of that, I had to stop because... and. <laughs> Because you know how a person get off of drugs and as long as they don't go back to it, they fine. My drug would have been turntables. Well, when I was in the world, I used to smoke like a half ounce of weed a day, I'm going to be honest. And I sold weight, so I'm from the street. God cleaned me up and all of that. But the point is, when I was a, I, I told him, I can't, I, I can't go back to DJ. I can't do that. Why? Because God delivered me. And this is not, Jesus didn't win souls this way. And he tried to argue, yeah, but nowadays, no. No, man. There's no nowadays. You can't, yes, Lord. You can't tell me to go back to what God told me to come out of. I'm sorry. It's, it's no, no, mm -mm. That's like even dealing with the word. You're not going to make me believe something now, I'm a teacher. God anointed me to teach. He's anointed me to teach. You're not going to make me believe something in here that he's taught me and had me research and show me that it's not in here or it's against scripture. You're not going to do that. See, because I'm not weak. I'm very strong. 
I, I taught martial arts too. I was a, a, a master of kung fu, over 12 different animal styles, a black belt in karate, and I had another art under my belt of martial arts. But the point is, is that the Lord took that character, which that, that's, that benefits the apostleship. Why? Because I'm not scared of nobody. Imagine being used by God to, to go visit a ministry because he sent you. And when he when you ask the Lord, why you got me going to this ministry? Why you got me visiting them? Why? And God will say, I'll show you. Just watch. And you sit down and you watch. And then you see how everything is out of order. And you go, oh. So now the Holy Ghost leads you to go to the leader of that ministry and pull them aside and say, listen, this book says to do that takes a lot of courage and strength to those that God has used this ministry to help. They said, wow, apostle, you help us get stuff done. Amen. Now they're on the right road, they straight, they cool, the ministry strong, and some ministries that don't have nobody in there, God used this ministry to go show them how to do street ministry and fill up the building. Yes, all of that. But to those that, this my spot, I got this. <laughs> Who you think you are? And then next, you know, the Lord lead me, he, he used me to put on a prophet's hat and to let them know, listen, you keep messing up. The Lord said, how do you want it? In days, weeks, or months? Because he's going to shut you down. No, he not. Every time he let me to say that, it happened. It, let, it happened. <laughs> it happened. Was I happy about it? No. And don't say, oh, he put a curse. No, no. You can't curse what God bless. You can't do that. If God is in it and he blessed it, can nobody curse it. That's like even if somebody prayed for you and they praying wrong. If God is, if you're walking with God and the Lord is the Lord of your life, they could pray wrong all they want to. Ain't nothing going to happen to you. Simple as that. Adam should have protected his wife. And instead, they made themselves aprons. Verse 8, chapter 3 says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, which in the Hebrew, it actually says the wind of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So a little while ago, they had relationship with God and they was working with God and they was fellowshipping with God. Now here they are hiding from God and running from God. You got to watch how you respond, not only to the word of God, but to the move of God. Because if God say, listen, even if you don't hear, listen. If somebody tell me the Lord says something, and I haven't heard God say it. I've learned, and this is in scripture. The Bible says, despise not prophesying. And then it says, and prove all things. I've learned. If I haven't heard God say yes or no to that, I'm not saying nothing. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I don't want to lie on God. I don't want to say God said something and he did. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It's not right. See, we got to watch how we treat each other, especially Christians, how Christians treat Christians. You got to watch that. Some of y'all get a phone call and you'll see who's calling and won't answer the phone. And you think God is behind that, especially if the Lord is telling them to call you and they're a woman of God or a man of God and you're supposed to be a woman or a man of God? You, you, you wrong. And you'll hinder your blessing. Some people are going through stuff because they're, they're running from God. 
or are trying to do things their way, making fig leaves to put around themselves, trying to cover themselves with their own righteousness. Because God didn't grab you and throw you all over the place, you think you're straight. No. No. I've seen the Lord allow people to do stuff and just allow them to keep on doing wrong, and then when judgment comes, he deal with them. And then they wish, oh, man, what happened to me? Man, you bought it on yourself. You sold to the flesh, you reap from the flesh. I know a prophet who went off, and the Lord let me to tell him, man, you better straighten up. God said, your fold is on his desk. Oh, I don't want to hear that apostle. And the Lord let me tell him, man, you only a prophet. See, when you, you know, apostles are not big giants, but because we walk in all four of the other offices, you can't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with no apostle, him, a male, a male, because in, in the Bible, there's no female apostles. Come on, let's be real. But you can't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with an apostle and call yourself challenging the word that God is using him to speak. If you're in the wrong, you can't do that because this word will help you or hurt you. Just like, listen, prophets and prophetesses, you can't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with no prophetess and, and rebuke her if she's not wrong. Mm -mm. She speak a word, you in trouble. Same thing with a prophet. Once that prophet do like this, you in trouble. <laughs> you in trouble. So Adam should have protected his wife, but instead he helped her hide from God. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to, unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now, you got to notice something. There really wasn't nothing wrong with Eve. Adam should have stepped up to the plate. He should have protected his household and all of that and protected his wife. None of that would have happened. Here's the first past the buck example in the human race. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Watch this. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. That means will you go from now on upon your belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, some of y'all, I mean, what teachers already know, but those that are the preachers, you know a woman don't have no seed, right? So this was a prophetic, this was a prophetic utterance. God himself was speaking about Christ, because this is a messianic prophecy. And God said unto the serpent, and he was talking to the devil, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Lord was talking to the devil right there. Even though he was using the serpent's body. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. That part was to the serpent. Then in verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. He's talking to the enemy there. It shall crush, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God, God asked Adam, was, why, how do you know you're naked? You did what I told you not to do? The Adam blamed it on a woman. So God looked at the woman. The woman blamed it on the serpent. God dealt with the serpent and the, and the, the, the serpent and the devil. Then God looked back at the woman and said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, 
and he shall rule over thee. Now, rule there is from the Hebrew word marshal. is used 81 times in the, in the Old Testament, and it means to rule, to reign, to have dominion. Marshal is used most frequently in the text to express the ruling or dominion of one person over another. Now, let's put this in context. That don't mean sit down, shut up, and do what I say. That's not what that means. What rule there means is governing her. You will, your desire going to be for your husband. You're going to want to be married. But understand this. I, 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 I don't want you by yourself because you, you can't protect yourself, apparently. But he shall govern you. He shall rule over you. He shall be responsible for you. He shall. Your husband. Listen, woman of God. Now I'm talking about the one that the Lord ministered to me about and the sisters that the Lord may have sent the man of God to, to, to pursue you. Listen. When God places the man of God in your life, man, you on your way. You're straight. Because the man of God is going to protect you. If he see your eyebrow, watch this. If he see your eyebrow do like this, whether it's drawn on or whether it's natural eyebrows, he see him do like this, he going to say, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's the problem? Why? Because God's going to hold him accountable to take care of you because you're God's daughter. He's going to protect you. I need some water. He's going to protect you. He's going to protect you. And this was God, he had reiterated this. Your husband shall be responsible for you. Simple as that. Submit to him. Because he's going to be responsible for you. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Now he's telling Adam, <laughs> because you didn't stand up and protect your home and exercise headship, but instead you became the one submissive and doing what your wife say. Go ahead and say it. Oh, you ain't say that. Look, verse 17. Because, and unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, because you listen to your wife, because you, you follow what she told you to do, and has eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee. He didn't tell her. He let Adam give his wife the instructions. But God told Adam, face to face, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Which actually in the Hebrew it says cause to bud it shall cause the bud to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return and Adam called his wife name Eve which means kavar or living because she was the mother of all living Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Look what he did. He forgave them. And he made clothes for them and covered them. He did. He provided for them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. Now here's another Trinitarian conversation. He's become as one of us. 
to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God put him out because God said, not in my house. Elohim officiated the wedding. But when they acted up after the wedding, God said, not in my house. And he put them out. Everything was lost. Everybody suffered. Adam suffered because he listened to his wife. His wife suffered because she listened to the enemy. Their kids suffered because they was born in a dysfunctional family. The serpent suffered because the enemy used his body. The devil was already judged. So misery loves company. The Lord put something in my spirit to share. And that is, okay, yes, Lord, because we we're going to close. This is going to be another part. We're just going to point the finger at the enemy, then we're going to pray and close. John chapter 10. Here's what Jesus said during one of the times he was teaching them. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's Satan's threefold ministry. To steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. That's Zo. Z-O-E. The, the life of God. The Zo life of God. And that they might have it more abundantly. He want us to, to enjoy being here, but to be focused on heaven. But he told what the thief, what his mission was. Write that down, John 10 and 10. That's what the devil does because he's the thief. In 1 John... Chapter 2, verse 15, the Apostle John wrote, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Pay attention to that. DJing is in the world. Mixing and cutting up and scratching and playing, you know. That's why the Lord told me, uh-uh, stop. And I mean, I used, to, I used to get on. I used to quick mix and cut, ch -ch -ch -ch, all that. But God said, stop. Stop. Love not the world, the ways, the fashions. The, it's all right to have design and stuff, but don't make it your God. Don't think because you got on Gucci that you the bomb. Listen, all I wear is reptile shoes, gators, snakes, crocs. But I don't think I'm the bomb. My hats are godfathers. I'm more comfortable in shirt and tie and suit. I mean, I got sweats and all of that yeah but i could go in my closet a couple of times and come out dapper but it's not about that it's not about that it's about holiness and living right trying to please the lord he blesses you see i used to be homeless when 27 years ago when the lord put me in ministry he allowed me to go through a few months of homelessness and he said this is why Street ministry is important. Whoa. I've never been homeless before. I, I didn't know this. He barred everyone from the trial of my life. There were some family members that let me stay with them here and there. I wasn't homeless long. 
that's because I went to jail for preaching. So I wasn't homeless long. But the Lord, he, he barred people from my trial to where I had to walk alone and go through it by myself. That took a toll on me because now if you wasn't there to help me when, when I was going through my trial and all I knew Jesus was there, you can't tell me nothing. Don't, don't, don't try to school me because God already did it when I was going through. He brought me out. Wish I could shout. I wish I knew how I would do it. Under the anointing, of course. But love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We learn to be content with what God gives us. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's why in the ministry, there's no carnal stuff coming in this ministry. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Ain't going to be no singles dance. And no, no. Wait a minute. That don't mean I don't know how to romance my wife now. Because I, I do. Serenaded the whole shebang. But ministry is God's turf and area. But he told me when he was training me for marriage and for my wife, he said, romance your wife. You're going to have to romance your wife because she's a woman too. You might have to. I'll let you sing to her. I'll turn my back and let you go ahead and sing to her. I'm a singer and a musician too. So go ahead and sing to her or, or you know, y'all could, y'all could dance, you know, not, not break dance. No, y'all could, y'all could, y'all could romance each other, know each other, spend time with each other. That, that's fine. Why? Because you got to keep, you got to keep that as well. You don't want the marriage to fall apart. And it's not about being holier than thou because for the, for the Lord I live, for the Lord I die. And that's why I need to marry a wife that's like that. And the woman he put in front of me, that's how she is. I look at her and I see for God she live, for God she die. Right now she kind of nervous because, you know, I, I could be a fake, but I'm not. But I mean, you know, I, I kind of understand. But I encourage her and every other sister, get strong in the Lord. Ask God. The brother that's pursuing you, ask God. I got ask God. Go listen, every leader should point you to God. Ask God. Go to God. Sit by yourself with the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to talk to me. Because if you sent them, I don't want to be outside your will and fight. But if you didn't send them, then I want to be protected. Lord, which one is it? Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the devil's threefold ministry to steal and to kill and to destroy. His threefold methods, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that's what he did to Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, Scripture says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that was the lust of the flesh. And then it says, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, that was the lust of the eyes. And then it says, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, that was the pride of life. The enemy did those three techniques and bust her up. Adam didn't even need to go through those three. He committed the ultimate treason by doing what God said not to do. So God himself made a body for himself and he came into the earth realm and he was led, that flesh named Jesus was led by the Holy Ghost who was inside that flesh, who was God into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 
Mark chapter 4. I mean, Matthew chapter 4. Verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he, afterward, he was afterward and hungered. And the tempter came to him and said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, being that Jesus didn't introduce himself, the devil already knew who he was. So in the Greek, it doesn't say if, it says since you be the son of God. Command that these stones be made bread. That was lust of the flesh. He already fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. The lust of the flesh. The enemy said, make this bread. Break your fast. That's the lust of the flesh. Then we jump down to verse 6. And saith unto him, if thou, if thou be the son of God, or again, since thou be the son of God, Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angel charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He quoted the scripture wrong, and he used it for the wrong reason. Twisting scripture. The Bible talks about uh, holding the truth in unrighteousness, and that's, that's what that is. He was wrong. And that was the pride of life to tell the Lord to throw yourself down, to kill yourself, jump off, commit suicide. God will catch you. That was the pride of life he tried to use. That didn't work. And then in verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And that was the lust of the eyes, showing him all the kingdoms of the world to appeal to him. And he does that to people. He'll show you, you know, if you get a lottery ticket and scratch it off, you could win. <laughs> you know? Even when the stimulus check come out, a lot of people are going to take that and abuse it instead of stretching it, saving it, not being a good steward, sowing in the wrong places. A lot of ministers have already put their dibs in for your check. Believe it or not, and for your income tax. They sure did. You'll see. If you're not wise. Now, when the Lord gives a woman to a man of God, I'm just going to say this and then we'll pick up on this later because the Holy Ghost is leading me to close. Two things. Proverbs 18:22. And in the King James, it reads on this wise. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Findeth is from the Hebrew word Saul is used 456 times in the Old Testament, and it means to come forth to come forth to, in other words, to appear or exist. It means to attain, in other words, to find or acquire. So it also means to find, to meet, to get. And you know, the word, that word findeth right there, it don't mean to go and look. Again, it's like if you're walking down the street and you find a piece of paper and you pick it up and said, I found a piece of paper. You was not looking for it, but it was in your path. So, so the right word to go in that, it, that, that, that gives a context is to meet. Whoso meeteth a wife, meeteth a good thing. Whoso getteth a wife, getteth a good thing. Whoso attains a wife, getteth a good thing. And obtain his favor of the Lord. The other word, Proverbs 19, verse 14. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Prudent is from the Hebrew word sarkal, and it means to be, cause, I mean to be, make, or act, circumspect. And you know what circumspect means. If you don't, circumspect means consider it cautious and reserving and hence intelligent to be prudent 
to act wisely, to give attention to, to ponder, to prosper. That's what sarkal means. So the prudent wife or the sarkal wife is going to be observant. She's going to act wisely. She's going to uh, be prosperous spiritually. And you know, also know how to get deals and sales and bargains like the virtuous woman. So she's going to be able to listen. She'll be able to take a dollar and make it stretch. Oh, what a wife. So, and consider it meaning she's not going to jeopardize her, her marriage. She's not going to jeopardize her relationship. Whew. See, here's why I would again need her right now to pray for me. Because that took a lot of me and I'm weak now. And we're going to come back and do part two. Because remember, we read two scriptures. Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive us for our sins and shortcomings of faults and wrongs. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for this time of sitting before you. Thank you, Lord, for all this. We just truly thank you. I ask, Lord, that you bless your daughters to hear you, to obey you, to follow you, to ignore the voice of the enemy, and just hear you. I ask that you bless your sons, your earthly sons, as brothers in ministry, that you set our wives on our way. Give us strength. Help us to continue to fast and pray and seek your face and to fight for our wives and to pray for them. And, oh, Lord, just thank you for everything, Father. Keep us before you. Let us have a blessed night and let everybody remember what they studied tonight. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, mighty and matchless name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. And Lord, please re strengthen me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night. Don't let nothing stress you. The Lord loves you, so does this ministry. You can call. 475-300-3850 for prayer or Bible questions or anything, even to vent, you know. Just have mercy, Lord, please have mercy on us, on all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So you have a good night. I got to go. I love you and God bless you. Stay encouraged. And may heaven smile upon you. God bless you. Whew. Wow. <laughs> that was deep. That was deep. And such a blessing. Thanks for joining me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you the next time where we dip back into the library to notice the prophetic chronicles. God bless you and enjoy your day.